Um, thanks very much, um, Gareth, and thanks very much to the organisers for the opportunity to give this, um, to give this talk. Um, so just to provide a little bit of context um, for some of the things I'm going to say, um, the notion that uh, physical activity is somehow less important than diet in the context of obesity is not really a new one, but of course it did receive a boost with the publication of this editorial as Gareth set out at the start of this uh, symposium. Uh, and just to highlight that this isn't just a, a British thing, um, this story made it to the United States as well. Here it is being repeated by the American Heart Association. And one of the problems that we face with some of these messages is of course that it appears in the press and this is the kind of thing which the public read. And the message in some of the newspaper articles was even more strong than in the uh, scientific papers, basically saying that you might as well not bother with physical activity and the new bad guy is of course uh, sugar. And the problem we face is that this reaches the decision makers. So here's a discussion in the British Parliament uh, on the context of, uh, sorry, on the subject of obesity. And Lord McCall is lambasting the Department of Health and NICE for their focus on exercise as a strategy for the prevention of obesity. And he's telling the people from NICE to go to the gym to try to understand just how little exercise contributes to uh, an energy deficit. So that's the context, and within this context, I see two very much interrelated questions. Um, the first question, which John also touched upon, is what exactly is the impact of exercise and physical activity on energy balance? Is Asim Malhotra and Lord McCall correct in their, in their view? And the second question is, what is the impact of physical activity independent of energy balance? Should we be focusing only on energy balance? So to tackle the first question, um, first of all, what I want to do is just to explain one of the tools that we've used quite a bit over the last few years to help us to get a handle on this question. Um, it's a bit different to the device that John was talking about. You can see uh, the instruments up, up here. Uh, you can wear them in one of two different positions. And it's not just an accelerometer. It does measure movement using accelerometry, but it also integrates uh, physiological signals in the form of heart rate. And then using a branch equation model predicts energy expenditure above rest. And it does this with an accuracy and precision which is really very similar to laboratory methods such as indirect calorimetry. So it's not perfect, but it does give us a very good estimate of energy expenditure through physical activity outside the lab. And this is the kind of information you, you get. So here's energy expenditure over the course of a 24-hour day. So here's sleep. And this is the ebb and flow of physical activity over the course of the day. There was no structured exercise on this individual uh, day. And we used these tools alongside a prescribed exercise intervention to allow us to pull out the energy that was expended during the prescribed exercise. And these are the results from one of those uh, studies. So I'll just explain what we've got. This was a six-month prescribed exercise intervention in self-reported sedentary uh, middle-aged men. Um, we've got, um, we've got um, physical activity energy expenditure on the left-hand side, and here's the, the, the time course of the intervention. This is the control group. This is the intervention group. And these hashed bars is the energy expended during the prescribed exercise. Now, by week 18, the people were engaged in around about four hours of exercise at an intensity of around about 70% uh, VO2 max. So a quite substantial amount of energy being expended through uh, exercise. And this equated, this equated to around about 15% of physical activity energy expenditure, which was somewhat less than 10% of total uh, energy expenditure. This, of course, could be an important amount. It could avoid weight gain, it might introduce uh, an energy deficit and lead to uh, weight loss. But perhaps the notion which is captured by uh, Malhotra and Lord McCall is that for four hours of demanding exercise, the reward in terms of the energy deficit is relatively modest. And perhaps what they're also trying to capture is the idea that it's much easier, as John was indicating in his talk earlier on, to consume much more energy than it is perhaps to burn it off, as Lord McCall said, through uh, physical activity. So does this mean that it's true? Does it in fact mean that you can't outrun a bad diet? 
Well, let's just look at this graph again. Asim Malhotra and Lord McColl are looking at this. They're looking at the amount of energy expended through prescribed exercise. But what about this? This is non-prescribed physical activity energy expenditure. Some people call it NEAT or non-exercise activity thermogenesis, or it's sometimes known as baseline physical activity or incidental physical activity or background physical activity. This is quantitatively a very important component. And yet, it's one which is very much often overlooked. We often ignore uh, uh, this kind of physical activity when we introduce exercise interventions. And I think human physiologists and exercise physiologists, and I include myself in that, have been guilty of this for some years now. When we prescribe exercise, we think that before the exercise was introduced, there was a blank canvas. There was nothing. We introduced the exercise, and we then monitor or measure the response to that particular stimulus. But of course, that's not really true. Before the prescribed exercise was introduced, something else existed, and that would be non-prescribed physical activity. And this is enormously variable and can add up to be a very significant amount and will almost certainly in almost everybody be greater than the introduced stimulus through the prescribed exercise. So the exercise is supplementing physical activity. It's not simply a direct uh, uh, relation between what we've introduced and what we might expect. And this is also a problem when we come to look at the physical activity guidelines. And of course, this is where we start to understand people's perceptions. So this is a screenshot from the physical activity guidelines in the UK from the NHS choices page. This is a, a public facing web page aimed at uh, disseminating exactly what people need to do. And there's a very clear statement down here that people need to do 150 minutes of moderate intensity activity a week. But if you dive into the uh, technical report which underpins those guidelines, you find that actually this is on top of baseline. So it's not 150 minutes. You would be mistaken if you think that it's the total cumulative amount of activity required. It's actually based on the additional physical activity over and above that associated with normal daily living. So it's not 150 minutes at all. It's actually 150 minutes on top of something else. But on top of what? How much activity does that mean uh, in total? Well, we've just recently published a very simple analysis where we tried to get a better handle on this, and I'll just explain what we, what we did. Um, we recruited 300 people from the local community, including 200 patients recruited through primary care. We assessed their physical activity energy expenditure using devices a bit like the ones that I've, I've shown you, and we then extracted the, uh, their physical activity level, which is a standardized way to express energy exp uh, expended through physical activity, against the time engaged in moderate uh, to vigorous intensity activity, the kind of things advocated by uh, the physical activity recommendations. And we can see a nice relationship um, over the sample as a whole. And a key point here is that not one person did less than 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity activity uh, a, a week. We know the average PAL in the UK, the average median PAL, according to the Scientific Advisory Committee for Nutrition, is 1.63 in the UK. This is similar to the average PAL reported in meta-analyses of uh, doubly labeled water data sets. And so if we assume that this is average energy expenditure and this is the relationship with moderate intensity activity, this equates to around about 730 minutes of moderate, intensity, vig vig uh, moderate to vigorous intensity activity. So people aren't doing less than 150 minutes. The vast majority of people are doing far in excess of that. But it's still not enough. We know that the PAL required to prevent weight gain is actually around about 1.75, or at least that's what it's predicted to, 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 to be. And if we plug that into our derived relationship, that would actually equate to around about 1,000 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity activity. And in order to achieve that PAL target would require an increase of around about 4% of waking time activity. So just to kind of put this into context a little bit, what I'm saying is that actually if you look at the guidelines, it's no, no wonder that people find this very, very confusing because it relates to 150 minutes a week, but that's not what intended when you look at the technical report. And it's a tiny fraction of time. It's about 2% of a, of a waking week. No wonder people, when they come to do the maths, start to think, how on earth could 150 minutes of exercise or activity, no matter what the intensity, possibly play a role in energy balance? 
what we're saying based on our analysis is the current median is probably around about 11% of waking time, around 700 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity activity. And the required amount is probably closer to about 1,000 uh, minutes. And once you start to think about 1,000 minutes, you start thinking of about 15% of waking time, you could start to see how vi uh, intensity, this, sorry, physical activity of this intensity could play a role in energy balance. But it's this kind of misunderstanding which erodes perceptions of the role of physical activity in energy balance. And of course, one of the other things that we neglect in talking about activity in these terms is we're talking about just moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity. What we really have to do is to characterize the full increase in energy expenditure above rest. And if we do that, then actually I think the picture is really, really very straightforward. Um, so here's a study where we recruited um, middle-aged men uh, from, the, from the community. Um, we placed them in rank order for total uh, energy expenditure from low to, to, to high. Um, and um, you can see that at the bottom end, uh, we've got people with about 2,500 kilocalories a day being expended in total, up to, at the top, well over 4,000 kilocalories a day. And we've got basal metabolic rate, physical activity, energy expenditure, and dietary-induced uh, thermogenesis. And hopefully what you can see uh, is that across the sample as a whole, uh, basal metabolic rate is broadly flat. And the variation in total energy expenditure is explained by variation in physical activity energy expenditure from a few hundred kilocalories down here to a couple of thousand uh, kilocalories up here. And if we do the maths on this, and it's just a very, very simple thing, at the extremes, this adds up to over half a million kilocalories difference per year. And if we translate that into the amount of energy stored in adipose tissue, it's very, very substantial. The amount of energy that we're talking about is clearly very important, and physical activity is explaining this variation, and clearly, therefore, plays a role in regulating energy uh, balance. Um, but just a point that I'd like to make is that most of this variability isn't explained by differences in exercise, it's explained by differences in non-exercise physical activity uh, thermogenesis. And of course, as a physiologist, if you want to understand your participants or you want to compare different groups or something like that, then of course, really, we should be introducing these kinds of assessments because if you recruit two groups of people, let's say old and young, for example, and you make a comparison, but you're young, you're older down here and you're young are up here, and you've, you haven't captured this information, of course it's extremely difficult to draw conclusions about what the true uh, uh, cause of any differences might be. But to conclude the first part of the talk and answering this first question, there's absolutely no doubt that physical activity is clearly a very important part of uh, energy expenditure. And as John was saying at the start, variation in total energy expenditure and therefore the amount that can be consumed is largely dictated by differences in physical activity, energy expenditure. So moving on to the second part of my talk, um, what is the impact of exercise and physical activity independent of energy balance? Well, a few uh, people have addressed this question in a different way in the past, and there are some very eloquent uh, studies which have been designed to address when you introduce exercise alongside caloric restriction and you match it for an energy deficit, adding exercise leads to additional benefits over and above just the energy deficit alone. But one of the problems with these studies is that, of course, you have introduced a deficit through physical activity, and so we still don't know whether it's the deficit which is driving some of these changes, or indeed the interaction between the exercise and the deficit which has led to these benefits. So we designed a different study to try to unpick this in a slightly different way, and this was published in the Journal of Physiology just over two years ago, and what we wanted to do was to look at exercise, but in the context of overfeeding and reduced physical activity. And I'll just explain the design from a conceptual perspective before I get on to some of the uh, results. So we recruited two groups of young, healthy, active men, and we assessed at baseline their energy intake and energy expenditure. And then we asked the surplus group to consume, based on their normal diet for a one-week period, 50% more than they would normally consume. And we also asked them at the same time to reduce their physical activity by to, maxima, a max, to a maximum of 4,000 uh, pedometer steps. So we introduced an energy surplus. 
In the other group, we did exactly the same thing, but we also asked them to do a daily bout of exercise for 45 minutes at about 70% of their VO2 max. Because they're expending additional energy, we also then provided additional energy in their diet so that we had, at the end, a similar energy surplus. So we have two groups experiencing an energy surplus, one with and one without prescribed exercise. And these are the results based on a number of measurements in terms of um, energy balance and surpluses. Um, so this is the surplus group on this side. So here's the energy intake, the energy expenditure, and this is the surplus that we achieved during the one week. And this is the same thing for the surplus plus exercise group. So the surpluses were similar in the two groups. And these are some of the results. So this is the uh, insulinemic response to a standard oral glucose tolerance test. And this is the data for, uh, these are the data for the uh, surplus group. So here's the insulin response. You can see there was a very profound increase in the insulin response to an OGTT in the group which experienced this surplus. In the exercise group, in response to the same surplus, there was basically no change. And I'll remind you that this was a very, very profound energy surplus, around about 17,000 kilocalories over the course of that week. If we look at other system, uh, systemic changes, we saw um, that exercise prevented or reduced changes in blood pressure, in total cholesterol, in LDL cholesterol, and so on. So clearly the exercise, even though there is a very, very profound energy surplus and the people were gaining weight, is doing something to counter those changes. And the most surprising thing for us was just how strong the effect was even in the tissue where the energy was being stored. So we took adipose tissue biopsies before and after the intervention. So here we've got the relative uh, gene expression, a value of one would be no change for these different genes. And we've got the surplus group and the surplus plus exercise group. And hopefully what you'll see is that the changes in the surplus group were very, very profound. And in the exercise group, they were either much, more, uh, much less uh, 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 severe or, uh, in some cases, non-existent. So the exercise is creating some kind of an effect even in the tissue where the excess energy is being actively stored. And so the conclusion from this study is that daily exercise protects against the negative impact of an energy surplus, even in the tissue where the energy is being stored. And we think that this overfeeding and reduced activity model is a useful way to truly unpick the in uh, independent effect of exercise because it's conducted within the context of a surplus. So what are the mechanisms for this particular finding? Well, the short answer based on this particular study is we, we don't know. I was hoping to be able to present some res results from a, a follow-up study, but we haven't managed to finish recruitment uh, yet. But we could look at some of the data and try to uh, make at least some uh, educated guesses. So one of the things that we did see, and this might be uh, to be expected, of course, is that even though we've managed to match the energy surplus, of course, the group that we're doing exercise was using more carbohydrate during the exercise. And so, of course, over the course of the week, when you add it up, even though they had a very positive carbohydrate balance, it was less positive than it was in the surplus group. So perhaps in the surplus group, coming back to some of the points that um, Audrey was saying, perhaps they've experienced an even more profound challenge in the context of particular nutrient balances. Another mechanism which could be related to that, but could be independent, is related to glycogen turnover. And what I mean here is not just simply using glycogen, but perhaps it's the using glycogen, then resynthesizing glycogen, and going up and down repeatedly over the course of the week. And the kinds of things which are triggered when you utilize glycogen, perhaps this could be one of the mechanisms, which of course wasn't experienced in the surplus group. Maybe there's some kind of myokines which are secreted in response to the exercise, which could be responsible for that, or some other contraction-mediated mechanism which we haven't yet identified. And this is, of course, very much taking a muscle-specific view when you try to interpret these findings. But, of course, one of the things that we measured were changes in adipose tissue, and we have to remember that adipose tissue isn't just a, a, a static tissue during, the, uh, during a bout of exercise. It plays an active role. It participates and responds to the changes which are taking place within exercise. And perhaps some of the kinds of changes that you see within adipose tissue might mean that even when it's storing energy, it's able to do so in a way which doesn't come with any negative consequences. 
And just to kind of illustrate that, here's a study we haven't yet published, but a single bout of uh, exercise, in this case, just moderate intensity exercise, does lead to changes in adipose tissue. So here we've got relative gene expression um, for a variety of different genes with a value of one indicating no change. And some of the changes were quite small, but some of the others were more, more modest. So adipose tissue does respond to exercise. And so some of the changes that we talked about earlier on might be because the adipose tissue is responding and able to deal with the energy surplus. We, we just don't know at the present time. So does this mean it's false? Does this mean that you can outrun a bad diet after all? Well, if we go back to the newspapers, of course, this is what the public re uh, read. Um, the message here was, yes, or uh, you can outrun a bad diet. And um, of course, they misrepresented some of the findings. But um, basically, the message here was that exercise is the right thing to be doing. But at least these guys said just over Christmas. If you look at some of the other newspapers, they simplified the message still further and made very strong statement that it's okay to overeat if you exercise regularly. And I don't believe this at all, and I don't think our study shows that. And one of our other studies, I think, actually makes the very strong argument that that isn't the, ca that that, that isn't the case. And quite a few um, uh, uh, different types of um, approaches and methodologies now have shown that um, in particular using statistical approaches, that if you are overweight and active, you're better off than if you are um, uh, overweight and not active. And we wanted to explore this in a little bit of a more direct way. And so we set out to recruit two different groups of uh, middle-aged men, in this case individuals, uh, one lean and one overweight, but both similarly active. And the only difference would be according to uh, uh, the level of adiposity. And this was an enormously challenging study to, to, to recruit to. Um, we ended up having to physically screen over 115 men just to get the re required sample size. But we, we did it, and we had two groups who were similar according to physical activity-related metrics or fitness, but different according to measures of adiposity, whether it's BMI or waist circumference or fat mass derived using DEXA. And these are the results. This was actually a reduced activity intervention study. So what we wanted to do, and our hypothesis was, because of the additional adiposity in the overweight active people, when we took activity away and asked them to reduce their activity for a week, they would have a more profound negative response to the withdrawal of physical activity. But we actually didn't find that. And these are the results showing the uh, glucose response to an OGTT, the insulin response to the OGTT. And what we saw in the lean men and in the overweight men was that the withdrawal of activity actually had a very, very similar effect, irrespective of the level of adiposity. But the main observation was that in spite of their similar levels of physical activity at uh, 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 in habitual levels of physical activity, the lean group were better off than the overweight group. And so it certainly seems that physical activity can't entirely compensate for the negative impact of adiposity. We'd like to think, of course, that the overweight active group are better off than an overweight group that doesn't do activity, but of course we don't have those data from this particular study. But what it does show is that in spite of the newspaper headlines, if you do overeat and you, even, and you maintain your exercise and activity, if you put on weight, then eventually that level of adiposity will start to exert some negative consequences. And so just to kind of reflect on this a little bit and try to put this into perspective and to bring together the two different parts of, of, of my talk, what... I believe is that we've spent a long time looking at the impact of exercise, structured exercise, and the impact on that from a physiological perspective. And clearly this is justified because that type of exercise and physical activity can have very profound effects, as I showed you in the context of overfeeding. But from an energy perspective, we have to reflect on the fact that it's contributing a relatively modest amount to energy expenditure and energy balance, and it's only a relatively small part of a waking week. And what we haven't done very well is to understand non-exercise activity thermogenesis and the impact of this from a physiological perspective. 
it's certainly responsible for a much greater part of physical activity energy expenditure and total energy expenditure. It varies enormously. So if you're comparing people, if you haven't measured this, you're missing out a big part of the, of the picture. And it takes place over a huge amount of time. And of course, people are starting to do this. They might not necessarily call it this, but they are starting to do this when you put people into bed rest studies. Because the biggest thing that you're changing is this. This is the type of activity that you're taking away. And what we have seen from bed rest studies, for example, is that even just a little amount of exercise can offset what are very profound changes through the withdrawal of physical activity. So what I would like to encourage people to do is to make sure that when they are trying to prescribe an exercise intervention or understand the response to a given stimulus, whatever that stimulus might be, that they make sure that they also include an assessment of the other aspects of physical activity in order to form a much more complete and uh, accurate picture. So just to kind of uh, conclude, um, what I've said is that physical activity is commonly, but very, very clearly, erroneously written off as an important part of energy balance. And we haven't helped that by focusing on structured exercise, and, we haven't, and the guidelines don't help by focusing on moderate to vigorous intensity activity or talking about 150 minutes when they clearly mean 150 minutes on top of other things. But what we also know is that specific forms of physical activity clearly have a very powerful effect on health outcomes independent of energy balance and even during a positive energy balance. And I showed you some of those results from uh, the, the, the study even in adipose tissue. But what we do know is clearly that excess adiposity is still very important. But based on energy balance, this could arise from underactivity as much as it does from overeating. And far too often I hear people thinking that if somebody is, uh, has, has excess weight, that this has all come from an excess of diet. Clearly it could also come from uh, a relative uh, low level of activity, as John alluded to uh, earlier on. So that's where I want to finish. I just want to acknowledge all the people who have contributed to this work and, of course, the, the, the people who have funded it. Thank you very much. <laughs>